Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I am here with Michael Del Castillo, who I think of as our crypto king. That's a bad term Ooh. these days. No, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it that way. You cover crypto and blockchain and, and especially how it's being used, you know, yep. across the enterprise, etc. So let's start with this uh, landscape right now, because it's confusing. It is. It's confusing. It's confusing and it's scary. And I think that downplaying the fear and uh, apprehension that is out there just is counterproductive. Um, it's legitimate. Uh, people are concerned. They have reason to be concerned. Um, but it's not the first time that crypto has faced a catastrophic event. Um, I always love to point people to the death of Bitcoin tracker, which is approaching 500 deaths of Bitcoin. Really? Um, and yet uh, it lives to tell another. It lives to tell know, another tale. Yeah, right? It's amazing how people sometimes don't get tired of hearing their own voice say that Bitcoin is dead. Um, it's frequently the same people saying it over and over and over again for years and years and years yeah. and years. Well, Mount Gox, I think of yeah. as one that was like a famous implosion. I think Mount Gox is the implosion that people are accurately comparing this moment to. Um, interestingly, uh, I, 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 I think Mount Gox was actually worse until um, very recently. So mm -hmm. the reason why I say that is at the time that Mt. Gox exploded... Which it, was when? What, what, do you remember uh, what year it was? 2013, okay. 2014. Right. Um, it was the exchange for the entire planet. Um, there was a lot of, you know, P2P transactions back then, individual to individual. Peer to peer, yeah. um, but the exchanges themselves were almost non-existent. Mt. Gox had, depending on how you count it, um, between 70 and 90% of the global volume was going through that one exchange. So when it exploded, it was a massive percentage of the entire industry that went down with it. Yeah. And and it and the industry emerged. In fact, uh, Coinbase was a direct result of that. Kraken was a direct result of that. These centralized exchanges that had um, institutional um, checklists to make sure that they were taking care of their customers. That that layer of maturity emerged from the Mt. Gox collapse. Um, and we've seen time and again, collapse after collapse after collapse, that the open source nature of crypto means that the developers in the space s identify the problems that the, ca the nearly catastrophic collapse um, uh, came from, and they write solutions for them. Well, it's interesting, though, because, you know, unlike, let's say, a financial, um, you know, collapse, yeah. you, know, you get the regulators come in and then there's new laws or Sarbanes-Oxley or there's, you know, Dodd-Frank, because this is a space where the regulators are just kind of coming to terms with it, what does a fix look like? Like, what really changed? Was it more transparency Good. and more controls after Mt. Gox? Um, so I think the exchange, the changes after Mt. Gox were, yeah, they were they were institutional grade uh, people with suits and ties. Sorry, crypto geeks, but um, not you and not me. People then. with yeah. people with MBAs and suits and ties uh, who knew traditional accounting practices, um, who had worked at uh, publicly traded mainstream financial companies that got involved and built. Um, solutions that were designed to fix the Mt. Gox problems. And they largely did so. And Coinbase is a multi-billion dollar company as a result of the problems that they fixed. And, and let's Gox. jump ahead to the gift that keeps on giving, which is, of course, Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX, yes. dominating the news. Maybe we should start with, like, what, what are the ripple effects we're seeing right now and, and any sort of discussion as to what needs to change next? Well, that's a great question. Um, the ripple effects are pervasive, all-consuming, and difficult to get your arms around. So it's almost like to, to, to pick one or two significant problems that are the problem um, might be a bit difficult, but I do think that we have enough information to start to intuit a bit. And, and, and that is, uh, I hate to say it, but a reaction against centralized exchanges, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, the lessons that the cryptocurrency community is learning from this are that if if the cryptocurrency is on a centralized exchange, it is not their cryptocurrency. It is that exchange's cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if there's a problem with the exchange and they can't get their money out, it's kind of 
they're they're accepting a degree of responsibility here. And the the responsibility that they're accepting is by taking their cryptocurrency off of centralized exchanges. What's the alternative? That sounds like chaos. Not to have, I mean, like not like I, the guy not to have some sort of centralized, transparent way to even gauge. So interestingly, it is counterintuitive, but the alternative, which is called a decentralized exchange, is actually more transparent. Um, and we've seen some evidence of resilience of these decentralized exchanges that is actually greater than Such the resilience. Such as what? What's a decentralized? Give us so an example. The, the, one, one of the biggest places to go that's like a truly open source um, financial infrastructure that individuals can use without having to ask for permission mm -hmm. is Uniswap. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to think of Uniswap as um, a, a, a common base layer of a centralized exchange, but that has then been turned over to the public. And who owns that? Or I want to say where it's based. It's almost like nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Homeless. Well, yeah. it's it, it's it's legitimately open source software. It mm -hmm. was it was developed by the Uniswap team mm -hmm. um, as a code base that was published on GitHub, an open source code repository that anybody can download and use. So it is true, the, the code itself is truly not owned by anybody. Um, but a, the, the company, the, I'm sorry, the group of people that created that code base now have a company mm -hmm. that is building on that code base, just like any other company could. And they've benefited from this situation where people are migrating, or is it well, more like so down the road? I, I, I think that it, it's very clear that money is leaving the centralized exchanges. We're, we're seeing um, outflows of a billion dollars plus on a day of people that had their cryptocurrency on these centralized exchanges that are seeing what happened with FTX. And even if they really love the exchange that they've been using, it's causing them to reevaluate their relationship with their cryptocurrency. You've got to keep in mind the original promise here was that you could be your own bank. Yeah. And these centralized exchanges essentially became crypto banks in a lot of ways. And the, the outflow off of these centralized exchanges uh, is, is a sort of hat tip to that old, uh, the, the original view of crypto of being your own bank. Um, it's hard to say who the single winners are going to be. There are actually a lot of decentralized exchanges. I just mentioned Uniswap as an example, mm -hmm. um, but there are many decentralized exchanges. And um, while there's no single winner today, I think we are seeing like as a class uh, that the money moving off of these centralized exchanges, a lot of it is ending up on decentralized exchanges. So we seem to be in the fear stage of, of yeah. whatever, you know, I'm not going to say recovery because that's, you know, <laughs> no. that's editorializing. Shame on me. But it's, uh, it, it does seem like when people are taking their money out, they're taking their money out and going, oh, forget crypto. I'm, I mean, like, shame on me for, you know, getting in almost GameStop style to see if I could, you know, but so where are we at right now with regard to even who's, who's seeing opportunity right now? Are you seeing, because it's a distressed asset in it's essence. It's wildly distressed. Um, and I will, I, I, I think you're right. There is a lot of uh, hurt feelings out there, mm -hmm. people feeling burned um, and people leaving that I don't think are ever going to come back. Um, and how much is their net worth down roughly from, and, and there's many, so many different currencies, obviously, but around, among the main cryptocurrencies, from the time that the scandal broke with SBF to where we are today, is it So decimated? I think the easiest way to talk about that is um, the, the net market value of all of the major cryptocurrencies. Um, that at its peak was about $3 trillion. Mm -hmm. um, and today it's at less than a trillion. Um, so more than $2 trillion of value has gone and, away. And is there a, a flight to quality in my mind? Is, is Ethereum, Bitcoin, or is that, again, a misnomer because those are the ones that also grab the retail investors who then get out quickly? Great question. No, I, I think that the, the flight to quality is um, a good way to put it. And I think that Bitcoin and Ether are among them, um, though there are many other um, Ethereum competitors that I think have really proven themselves to be worth taking a closer look at. Um, I really do think that 
while the the fallout is being reflected in the value of the cryptocurrencies, um, it's more being reflected in the movement from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges. And also, I should throw out there um, hardware devices that are designed to not have you use an exchange at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing a lot an uptick in sales in a lot of um, basically USB sticks that are designed to hold your Bitcoin private keys. They have some elaborate ways to prove that you are, the, in fact, the owner of those private keys before you're allowed to right. have access to your funds. Um, those are the winners. I, I, I think that, um, in fact, the relative decrease in the price of Bitcoin specifically um, shows a resilience. Um, we've only seen the, the, the asset drop by a couple thousand dollars, um, and that's to say from like 20 down to... 16, 17 on any given day. Um, and I actually think that decrease is relatively small considering the the sheer ramifications of the rest of the fallout, um, which to me means that a lot of people, while, while they're concerned about crypto, generally speaking, um, they're more concerned about the way that these companies were set up and they want to see that change. You know, Prior to this, again, I don't want to make this sort of like a, you know, before and after um, SBF, but we did see this almost um, institutionalization around crypto of, of countries, uh-huh. was it Ecuador, that was, you know, yeah. kind of like going big. And, and, and then, you know, a lot of the uh, banks talking about it in a way that was different and more yeah. accepting. Has that backtracked at all or any of thoughts as to this, um, you know, not so much democratization as as really maturity, to your point, that it could be in the enterprise. Are they now, like, glad I stayed away from that? So um, the first part of your question, uh, I think that we, we are, in fact, seeing some reactions against the, air, the, the, the industry, the crypto industry, we'll call it, by institutions. Um, a lot of the institutions were investors in FTX yep. and lost a lot of face. Um, we're starting to learn that it seems like there was a decent amount of groupthink among those big names. Um, Including pension funds. Pension right? funds, uh, hedge funds, uh, multi, multi billion dollar companies that seem to have been group thinking with their, their participation in the FTX ecosystem. There was very little due diligence. Um, a lot of people that didn't want to miss out on the the golden boy image that mm-hmm. Sam Bankman Fried brought. Um, but I was kind of shocked after in, in the weeks after the fallout, um, myself and our Forbes Digital Assets team were hitting the phones, um, interviewing um, C suite and uh, chief developers at some of the biggest financial institutions in the world as Mm -hmm. part of the vetting process for Mm -hmm. our blockchain 50 list. Mm -hmm. And almost without exception, their projects were going on unchanged. Um, What has changed over the years is these institutions are kind of shifting away from what we used to call enterprise blockchain or distributed ledger technology similar to blockchain, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't have a cryptocurrency, Mm -hmm. um, to public blockchain projects that don't that are that are that are faster and more private than they used to be. So the enterprise blockchain world emerged out of institutional distrust of public blockchain because it they couldn't protect their customers' privacy, which they mm-hmm. were uh, regulatorily obliged to do. And these these public blockchains were doing seven, eight, nine transactions per second, mm-hmm. not even close to the volume that these institutions needed. And so they built uh, versions of blockchains without cryptocurrencies that solved both those problems. Um, Seeing big companies like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Societe Generale mm-hmm. um, doubling down on their projects that are using public blockchains that um, simultaneously are faster and more private than they ever used to be is really the direction that we're seeing the movement. Um, I, I was surprised by that. Uh, I, I really was expecting to hear that our projects are being killed, our projects are being killed. Well, you did write about a project that was just, if not killed, delayed, which is the Australia yes. Securities Exchange. Now, that may be a different 
situation. In fact, the 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 death of the ASX project, and I think it is dead. Oh, six years. Yeah. Of- and that was of the, the enterprise blockchain type. That was of the blockchain type that this these um, infrastructures were created to give institutions some of the same promises of network effects that blockchain provided, but in a way that they could control. Now, ironically, by by holding on to that control, they lost a lot of the network effects. Ah. Um, they had can't to, have it both ways. They, they did. They had to pay their own um, cloud infrastructure costs. You know, they had to pay mm. a lot more out of pocket to maintain these. Um, relatively small networks, you know, with like 5, 10, 15, 20 companies on them. Um, And now that the privacy solution and the speed solution exists for public blockchains, uh, these companies are sort of reevaluating a lot of that work. I I don't want to conflate blockchain with crypto because, you know, in some ways I've always thought of blockchain as something that could, you know, transform supply chain management, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Crypto is that one that feels more risky, you know, no central bank. Are they, how much, I mean, you seem to be intertwining them to some extent. Um, is that what companies are doing now in terms of their approach? So I think of blockchain as um, a neutral ledger technology. Yeah, distributed. And, yeah. Uh, you can build cryptocurrency with blockchain. You can build NFTs with blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, you can create a version of the internet without centralized servers powered by distributed networks of computers using blockchain. Um, the so when if, if I say blockchain, I'm usually talking about all of that. Right. Um, and our 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 annual list that reviews these uh, these projects are application neutral. Mm-hmm. So we are looking at cryptocurrency. Even Bitcoiners hate that we call Bitcoin cryptocurrency. They say we're not a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is different than all these others. What do they call it? Bitcoin is Bitcoin. <laughs> Crypto is everything else. Hubris is so hubris. It's, yeah. <laughs> right? There's there's a lot of um, linguistic games to try and create distinctions. Um, But for me, like blockchain is a base layer behind the scenes application neutral infrastructure that you can do all of these different things on top of. So you talked about some structural issues that were fixed with Mt. Gox. Like Theranos, you know, the whole FTX situation seems to be in some ways potentially allegedly classic fraud. And and so does that really it, it doesn't you know, a Ponzi scheme's a Ponzi scheme. Fraud is fraud. Of course, we don't, he'll have his day in court. But is it really reflecting on the sort of fundamental technologies in the minds of people? Or are people identifying this as that's fraud and that's creating an opportunity because the fear factor is, you know, essentially taking these assets and grossly undervaluing them? Like, how, how many people are out there buying distressed assets? Is it the same characters that left at Mt. Gox? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the the asset class as the, the asset class isn't going away based on the investors that I'm talking to. Uh, we've seen um, a, a lot of investors that actually did in fact get rich off of the Mt. Gox collapse. Uh, they bought promises um, to be made whole uh, from people whose money was trapped on Mt. Gox when it collapsed at a massive discount. It's almost like buying bonds at a discount. When it we, is, yeah. yeah. And when 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 um, Mt. Gox collapsed, Bitcoin was, I'm just making this up, we'll say $600. Right. Um, with the appreciation of Bitcoin, even though what was left over was a tiny fraction of uh, th- what was lost, all of the Mt. Gox uh, losers, so to speak, ended up being made whole, or, or I believe will eventually end up being made whole. Um, the same same wish is happening right now. The, a lot of the investors that uh, got rich off the Mt. Gox demise are shopping for distressed assets. Um, what about the blowback with uh, you know government now paying closer attention to this? Let's look out to next year. What do you predict? It's going to happen. Uh, I predict. I, what are you seeing? We're not <laughs> soothsayers here. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not a predictor. I've uh, been around too long to make predictions about the industry. Um, but what I will say that I think is a, a, a narrative that has really crystallized over the past couple weeks um, is that I think it's becoming almost certain 
uh, that the SEC will never create new regulation for crypto and blockchain as has been called for um, for, Why not? A, for 10 years. Uh, they have always argued, except for one or two holdouts, uh, they have uh, almost exclusively argued that the current regulations are fine. Mm -hmm. That securities law is securities law is securities law. And it's not a question of trying to create uh, a third category, you know, security, non-security and crypto, mm -hmm. um, but just figuring out which crypto fits in which of the existing categories. Uh, Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, um, is aggressively going after FTX after sitting on his hands for a little while, seemingly getting the lay of the land, um, and has made it very clear that they are ready to act on other um, bad players in a similar way that they are acting on FTX. And but, that is without changing the regulation. But caveat emptor is sort of his, his like, you know, if you want to be in this space, don't look to us to well, yeah, protect I mean, you? They've been, they've been saying for years, you know, if you want to be in this space, come to us and ask for permission. You know, let's do it the right way. Um, and then consistently not giving that permission. Um, so it seems it's, it's now starting to look very likely that the SEC will never change the regulation, may never give that permission and is just waiting for the industry to implode. Which, okay, so that, there you go. Um, I wanna look, talk more broadly about digital assets because NFTs, you know, is that suffering the same fate? I know that the Taylor Swift fracas raised the, you know, conversation again about why don't we have NFT yeah. tickets, et cetera. What's happening in that part of the industry? Um, NFTs are, I think they were already hit before the collapse. Because of um, the economy or? Uh, I think because of the hype cycle that applies to pretty much every new technology, I think they just like, they had that giant explosion. They're somewhere in the trough of despair right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some really interesting stuff going on there with figuring out ways to actually implement some of the promises uh, that royalties could be paid out using automated um, contracts written into these NFTs. I still think that's a really cool possible future, though it turns out the promises uh, are a lot further off than, mm. than we originally thought they were. Um, and I think NFTs, you, you mentioned the tickets application. Um, people were furious at Ticketmaster for botching the, the, the Taylor Swift concert. Um, and it definitely reminded people that there's an alternative. Um, there's a way to prove that uh, a ticket exists only in one place at a time without having yeah. to rely on a Ticketmaster. Yeah, or a bot can't get it as easily as a person. Indeed, you know? indeed. Um, now, so let me just put myself as we, again, for this year ahead in different roles, and let's put myself, I'm, in, I'm an investor, and again, you're not giving me advice, but what should I be watching on the landscape in terms of, you know, either significant developments or or signals that um, people should be watching for? Because there's an exhaustion around just looking oh, yeah. at SBF. Like, so let's separate from that. What else is on your radar? So this is kind of, I think, the the worst news, so to speak, um, from from my perspective, um, I, I mentioned earlier on that every collapse and every recovery has felt different, and you don't get thick skin because it's different attack vectors. Right. Um, this feels different to me in a way that could imply a longer recovery than we had to wait for the other bears. So, um, because the damage is so great, or yeah. they because the damage is so great, both from an infrastructure perspective. I mean, if you've seen the, the sheet of FTX and its subsidiaries, it was just like this behemoth with like kind of like 50, Enron, isn't it? With special I've purpose seen vehicles? side by sides with the Enron specs, and Enron was actually less complicated at the time of its really? collapse than FTX was at the time of its collapse. So, like. It wasn't just FTX, you know, the, 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 there, there were customers of these subsidiaries and customers of those customers that um, have, have lost their confidence, they've lost their enthusiasm. If they were building, maybe they're slowing down their building. Um, and and, and the, the reputational damage beyond just the, uh, the business relationships themselves that were destroyed, 
I think is, is even worse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so pervasive. Uh, it, the, the, the result of um, FTX being shuttered is that Binance is now transacting about 70% of all crypto volume, which if you'll remember was roughly the same volume that Mt. Gox had. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking at a percentage risk that is as big as Mt. Gox, um, but with much more people paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's leading to just so much caution. Um, it's, it's worth noting that just coincidentally, um, we are coming out of one of the busiest venture capital rounds in the history, venture capital years in the history of crypto. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people don't need crypto to be doing well. They have war chests to build for years. And some of them have runway that could be a decade or longer. So while, while I, I do believe that this bear market is probably going to take a longer time to recover from than last bear market. Years? Years, yeah years um I, I i would say two to three maybe even four years mm -hmm. um before people have gotten over the shell shock of this moment um but those runways for those companies that raise that capital um led by in many cases brilliant ceos doing really cool stuff is are long and as uh consumers uh, investors retail investors and institutional investors alike start to heal their wounds, um, we will see the results of these giant venture capital raises starting to bear fruit. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens in three to four years from now um, when hindsight of this uh, collapse uh, coincides with the launch of the technology that's being built right now. It could be very interesting. In the same way that people say you shouldn't time the market because, you know, um, even the most brilliant people aren't good at it. Is this the same situation? Because one of the questions people have, and it's what people are telling you, should, if you have your little residual, you know, cryptocurrency left, should you be getting out? Like if it's four years of misery, you know, go put it in a, whatever, inflation adjusted bond or it, without giving advice, what are, what are people saying and what's sort of the general chatter around that? So, um, I do want to start by saying that uh, a lot of my readers love this about me. A lot of my readers hate this about me. Um, but I committed to my readers in 2014 that I would not invest in crypto. Yeah, which um, gives you a clarity of I thought. I like to think it does. Clarity of thought. I like to think it does. But um, I don't have skin in the game in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, I have skin in the game in the sense that my career is right. built on telling these stories. Um, I, I think that... Um, the, 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 I don't want to give advice. What are people, um, but what, I, what's I, the chatter? People are getting their stuff off exchanges and they're not selling it. Um, so you I, get it off an exchange and you don't sell it. So let's say you've got something on Coinbase. It, that seems like a level of sophistication that would almost preclude the retail investor. I like being able to call up. Uh, my bank if I forget my password and you know get a, a password reset a lot of people like that and they're happy to continue working with the Coinbase's and Kraken's and Binance's of the world because you get customer support um, but I think a lot of people are going to do the cost benefit analysis and decide that you know having somebody to call when things go wrong on one level on an individual level isn't worth the risks of having things go wrong on an institutional level right and they and instead of selling their bitcoin instead of exiting though we are seeing some of that like i said there's there's some folks with a lot of hurt feelings yeah. that are, are, are burning the bridges on their way out right but there's a lot of others that are just they're learning a different lesson they're learning the lesson that they don't want their crypto on centralized exchanges and instead of selling it to uh, the the next fool, uh, as as some people like to call born uh, every day, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, they're keeping it for themselves. They're moving it into a decentralized exchange where they own their own private keys, or they're moving it onto a hardware device where they own their own private keys. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and anything else on your radar that um, you're looking at in this space? I'm really interested in the products that some of the world's largest banks are building using public blockchains. Um, in the early days of so-called enterprise adoption, uh, they were thinking massive 
um, replatforming, like an entire company's financial infrastructure moving to a decentralized system. And they, that's what happened, I think, with ASX, the Australian right. Exchange. Right. Um, it's almost they, like private cloud, public cloud. What's they the went, economics? Right? Yeah, it's similar. Um, they, they they were just doing such a giant project, uh, could not get enough buy-in from all the different counterparties that it takes to do a decentralized infrastructure like that, and it ended up uh, withering on the vine. Uh, but these new DeFi projects, decentralized finance projects being built uh, by publicly traded companies and banks that our parents know and trust, um, uh, on a product by product basis, where instead of redoing the entire infrastructure, they're saying, okay, we have a $4 billion healthcare fund. Let's tokenize $100 million of that and sell it in a way that we can have the average investor being worth only $5 million instead of $100 million. And so we're able to achieve some of that democratization of mm -hmm. finance that the early enterprise blockchain projects promised. Um, but on a fund by fund basis, mm -hmm. instead of trying to rewire the way a bank does funds. Right. And so I that's think that's good. what's really interesting. Okay, good. Well, more to watch. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.